or in tape. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So shall I begin? Um, uh, yeah, should, should we, um, Roy, should we get started or? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe you can make one minute or something. Not much more than that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Wait, one, one minute. So you have nine people as participants, okay, so including the speaker and uh, so yeah, hopefully some more people will show up. But anyway, so I don't think we should wait much more time. Just let uh, maybe half a minute more and then. Okay. 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 All right. I think I think anybody else who comes will catch up. Um, so. Really happy to introduce Michael Larson for this uh, today's colloquium speaker to give this pre-talk. Um, Michael's distinguished professor at Indiana Indiana University. Um, I've I've been admiring his work since I was a graduate student, and haven't been <laughs> uh, lucky enough to see him speak until today. So, <laughs> if you are a graduate student, count yourself lucky to <laughs> get in this early. Um, and yeah, the colloquium is going to be about some something at the interface of computation theory and algebraic geometry, and Michael's going to pave the way for that in this talk. So thanks so much for agreeing to do this, Michael, and the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I have actually um, talked in the Ohio State University in person, um, but it was a while ago, and uh, this is anyway a novelty for me, um, uh, though I teach every day this way. Um, I still don't have the mechanics down as well as I like. Um, so uh, I know it's kind of a mixed audience, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, this is a this is really a pre-talk pre-talk. Um, so uh, I'll begin by by uh, just um, uh, reminding you what a, a representation is. So here will be a finite group, and uh, the representation will be an action on a vector space. So it will be a complex vector space. And this is a, a C linear action. Sorry, Michael, I, th I think you need to reshare your screen. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Let me do that again. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes. OK. Yeah. OK, so this is about, about a formula which is due to Frobenius. And uh, it concerns um, representation theory of finite groups. So I just want to remind you of uh, kind of what that looks like. So we have a finite group G acting uh, in a C linear way on an n-dimensional complex vector space. Um, if we choose a basis, we can think about this very concretely as a, as a homomorphism from G to G L N C. And um, of course, a different choice of basis would give us a different homomorphism, but they'll, they'll be the same up to overall conjugation. So in particular, we define chi of G in the trace of uh, rho of G. Uh, this won't depend on, on um, if, we, if we conjugate a matrix, of course, the trace stays the same. So this um, it, uh, depends only on, on the representation not on the choice of basis. And um, it's sort of remarkable, uh, if, you, if you haven't seen this before, uh, how much of the uh, overall structure of the representation is, is captured just by this function chi. I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing. Um, I, I should say that chi is what's called the class function. By which I mean that um, chi of g depends only on the conjugacy class of g, not, not on g itself. And, and the reason is, I think, pretty clear that if we have, uh, for example, um, rho of um, g x g inverse, uh, that would be the same as rho of g, rho of x, rho of g inverse. So this will be conjugate to rho of x. And so the trace of the left side and the right hand side will be the same. Um, so you say that uh, representation 
is irreducible if there is no non-trivial um, uh, G-stable subspace, except for the obvious subspaces, the zero subspace and uh, all of V. Um, so this, this is the definition we would use for any group, but for finite groups, or more generally for continuous representation of compact groups, you get something else for free. So, um, so it turns out, so if, I mean, there's another notion of irreducibility you might have used, so maybe I should just say, if suppose you have two representations, row one and row two, you could talk about the, the direct sum of these two representations. And what that would look like is, you know, you'd have a representation row one and a representation row two. And you could think of them as homomorphisms to, to M by M and N minus M by N minus M matrices. And so the, the homomorphism, the, I mean, this is what it would look like when we apply row one plus row two to an element. And of course, when we take a trace, we just, taking the trace of this matrix and adding it to the trace of this matrix so that the, the character associated to chi one to row one plus row two would be the sum of the two characters chi one and chi two. Now, if somebody actually gave you a homomorphism, it might actually be hard to tell um, whether it's irreducible or not because you might have the wrong, by giving you a homomorphism, you know, like uh, with a, an explicit basis. So an explicit homomorphism to GLNC could be hard to tell whether it's irreducible, because you probably wouldn't have the basis that sort of reveals um, you know, that, that it's of this form, and you'd have to somehow find a basis. But it turns out that by looking at the character, you can figure it out, and I'll explain how you do that in a minute. But first, I just want to finish what I was saying before, which is uh, the following thing, which is that if W contained in V is a, a, a G sub representation, oops, stable, I mean, as a whole, that is, say a vector in, in W gets sent to another vector in W by an element of G. If this is a G sub representation, then what I'll call W perp is also a G sub representation, sub representation, and V as a whole is a direct sum of W and W perp. So that, in fact, uh, we have this very nice uh, picture, uh, which uh, is that just having a sub-representation uh, enables you to actually decompose a representation as a direct sum of two pieces. In general, for, for, for general groups G, you might have a sub-representation and no complementary factor. Now, I've cheated. I talked about W perp. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, of course, if I'm sitting inside CN, there's a standard way that you have an inner product on CN, but there's no guarantee that the G action respects that inner product. The point is you can find an inner product which is um, which the G action respects, and you take the uh, inner product with respect to that. Why can you do it? Well, basically, you take any inner product. Uh, G may act and give you a different inner product for each element of G. You can average those inner products and get an inner product which, is, which the G action respects. Um, and, and in this way, you can um, see that if a, a representation uh, fails to be irreducible, then it actually can be written as a, as a direct sum of two factors. Okay, so this is kind of uh, overall background. Um, now I want to come to the kind of the big, um, and I would say very unexpected, at least I found it very unexpected when I learned about it for the first time, a theorem of the subject, which is that irreducible characters um, uh, give an orthonormal basis for the vector space of class functions um, with respect to certain inner product, write down what the inner product is. So if you have two class functions, phi and psi, I'm going to define the inner product of these as the average uh, over all the elements of the group of phi of g, and I'm going to, I want this to be a Hermitian type inner product, we're dealing with a complex vector space. So I want anything dot itself to be greater than or equal to zero. So this defines, uh, this defines an inner product and the irreducible characters are an orthonormal basis. So there's all sorts of consequences which are not obvious. Like for example, 
there are finitely many irreducible characters for a group. I mean, you might think there could be infinitely many irreducible representations for a finite group G, but there aren't. Uh, in fact, the number of irreducible representations is equal to the number of context C classes, which is another very non-obvious fact. Um, another thing is you can recognize an irreducible representation by, so if chi is a character, then when we take the inner product of chi with itself, um, this will be one if and only if chi is irreducible. That follows immediately from the orthonormality. Um, here's another uh, consequence of this. Um, so let phi be the function defined in the following way, equal to the order of the group if g is the identity and it's zero otherwise. So we can take the dot product of phi, uh, maybe I'll do it the other way around, it doesn't really matter. Um, let's say I do um, a chi phi. What is this going to be? Well, it's one over G times this sum. But if you think about what the sum is, it's just, well, it really becomes a one term sum corresponding to G equals one. So we just get um, G times um, chi of one. So this is just equal to chi of one. And from this, it follows that phi is equal to the sum over all characters chi, all irreducible characters chi, of chi of one times chi. This will be something which is very useful for us later on. Now, how do you prove this theorem? Unfortunately, this is a 30 minute talk. It's, it's, it's you know, I can't fit everything in. It's, it's, actually not hard, um, uh, but I, I don't have time. But I do want to mention one thing in, in connection with the proof, which is a kind of key step, which is something called Schur's Lemma. And what Schur's Lemma says is the following thing. So if rho is irreducible, uh, and uh, m is a matrix, an n by n matrix, uh, which commutes with uh, rho of g, so it commutes with every element in the image of the representation rho, then in fact m is a scalar matrix. And um, yeah, so um, why is that true? I mean, roughly speaking, the reason is if lambda is a, an eigenvalue of m, the lam if you take the lambda eigenspace of m, um, that the fact that, that M commutes with rho of G will tell you that the, the lambda eigenspace is preserved um, by all the rho of Gs, and, and that's enough to show that it's a sub-representation, but we're assuming irreducibility. The sure limit is it's hard, but it's incredibly useful. Now I want to um, uh, turn to the uh, Hermanius formula, which I haven't yet stated, uh, but I'll sort of uh, approach it um, this way through a following corollary uh, to Schur's lemma. Uh, so uh, for all x in g, we can consider the sum g in g of rho of g inverse x g, let's say. Um, and this is scalar. Right, so this is the claim. And why is this true? Well, what happens, let's call this sum, I don't know, S for sum. What happens if I take uh, well, rho of H and I multiply by the inverse here and then I take S and then I multiply by rho of H? Um, what do I get? I get sum over G of, well, using the fact that rho is a representation, rho of H inverse G inverse X G H and if I write this as GH inverse, then this is the same thing as, as sum over GH in G, which I'll now call, I don't know, K of rho K inverse X K, which is then equal to S. So that S uh, commutes with a rho of H for every H, therefore by Schur's lemma, it's scalar. 
And it's not very difficult to say two other things about S, which are both kind of interesting. Um, one is that if C uh, contained in G is the conjugacy class of X, then when we do this sum, what we end up doing is we, in effect, we end up summing over the conjugacy class C, but of course, uh, each element of C is hit several times. How many times? Well, it'll be the order of the centralizer of C, or to put it another way, uh, we can write, rewrite S as uh, the number of elements in G divided by the number of conjugacy classes times uh, sum over C in C of rho of C. That's one point that I want to make. And the other point that I want to make about, about S is that, okay, it's a scalar matrix, and we know it's trace. Just by definition, uh, we have a sum of matrices, well, it's not quite, it's the linearity of trace. The trace of S is going to be the sum over G and G of the trace of this expression, which is to say chi of G inverse XG. But I mean, these terms are all conjugate to each other, and chi is a class function. So in fact, this is nothing but number of elements in G times chi of X. So um, what we can do is we can say that, um, uh, yeah, so what can we do? We can say that, um, ah, we can say that one over the number of elements in G times S is a scalar matrix of trace chi of X. So what does that mean? It means that it's chi of X divided by chi of one times the identity. Why do we divide by chi of one? Well, chi, rho of one is the identity matrix. So chi of one is the size of the matrix. And of course, if you know the trace of a scalar matrix, it's the dimension of the matrix times the scalar value. So if you divide the trace by the dimension to get what the scalar entry is. Okay, so this is, this is a formula for S. Okay, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, generalize this slightly, but it, sort of in a, in a trivial way. So I want to fix a positive integer n, and I want to look at 1 over g to the n times the sum over um, g1 dot 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 gn in g of the following expression, rho of g1 inverse x1 g1 g2 inverse x2 g2 dot 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 gn inverse xn gn. So if you think about this sum, what you see is that, I mean, we can factor this, this row of this complicated expression into row of this times row of this and so on up to row of this. And so we end up with n independent sums. And so what we, what we are going to get when we do this is, right, we're going to get, okay, let me, of course, I can't quite fit, fit everything on the screen before. So again, we can express this as being a product as i goes from 1 to n of 1 over g times some rho of gi inverse xi gi. And what is this uh, product? So, I mean, uh, in this formula over here, we know that G is included in this product. 1 over G times each of these sums is chi of the corresponding x i over chi of 1. So this is just going to be chi of x1 dot, dot, dot chi of xn divided by chi of 1 to the n times the identity matrix. Or if we uh, wanted to take the trace of uh, both sides of this equation, uh, what we would get is, uh, again, 1 over g to the n times sum, again, over g to the n of chi of g1 inverse x1 g1 all the way up to n inverse xn gn. And that is supposed to be equal to um, the trace of this. And the trace of this, I mean, scalar matrix, so that the trace is 
the scalar times the dimension of the matrix, which is chi of one. So this is chi of x1, chi of xn, divided by chi of one to n minus one. Sorry, it's a little hard to read. The product of chi, chi of x1 through chi of xn, divided by chi of one to the n minus one. Okay. Now, uh, this is a very nice formula, but what I really want to do is I don't, I, I would like to look at the sum, but I don't want to really sum chi, I want to sum a different class function. So I would like to understand the following expression, one over g to the n. This one over g to the n just means the average value. So sum over m of phi of g1 x1 dot 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 all the way up to gn. This is just an abbreviated way of writing the same uh, product over here. Where phi is what? Phi is the same function I defined uh, quite a bit earlier. It's this function up here, which is order of g when g is equal to one and zero otherwise, and which can be written as a linear combination of the irreducible characters uh, where each character appears with multiplicity chi of one. So why do we want to, um, why do we want to sum this? Well, what does this mean? So this is equal to one over g to the n minus one times the size of the following set, g1 dot 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 gn in g to the n, such that this complicated expression g1 dot 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 gn is equal to one. That's what it's equal to. Now, okay, uh, how many elements are there? So basically what I, what I want to do is the following. Uh, I want to, if I look at this sort of product here, which I'm maybe writing in too abbreviated a form, if I think of it in this form, what I'm doing is I'm taking a conjugate of x1, a conjugate of x2, and so on, all the way up to a conjugate of xn, and I want to know if, if those products, if that comes out to one. So let me again, uh, give you notation, so let ci be the conjugacy class of xi. So then what we're dealing with here is, um, as before, we're going to count each element of the conjugacy class ci several times, namely g over ci. So we have to multiply all those factors together. So what we're dealing with is g over c1 dot 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 g over uh, cn times 1 over g to the n minus 1 times the number of elements, I'll write, write little c1 dot 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 little cn in c1 cross dot 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 cross n such that the product c1 c2 dot 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 cn is equal to 1. So I'm counting the number of ways I can write one as a product of something the first conjugacy class, the second conjugacy class, and so on up to the nth conjugacy class with this sort of funny multiplier, which I have to worry about at the end when I'm trying to write down a formula, but which is, doesn't complicate things. So I guess what I'm saying is I can solve the problem. If you give me n conjugacy classes, I can count the number of ways of writing one as a product of representatives of this conjugacy class. I can do that assuming that I can figure out how to evaluate the sum. And evaluating the sum shouldn't be that complicated because I know how to evaluate the, the corresponding sum. You see, if chi is an irreducible character, and I know how to write phi as a linear combination of the chi's. I'll remind you from above that phi is equal to the sum over all chi's irreducible of chi of one times chi. And therefore, when I when I want to uh, evaluate a little more, and I want to evaluate one over g to the n times sum over g to the n, p of um, <clears throat> one inverse all the way up to g n. This, this is the sum I'm interested in. This is going to be the same thing as sum over chi, chi of one times what I would have got if I had taken one over g to the n, sum over g to the n chi of g1 inverse dot 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 gn. So putting all of this together, and you know, I'm getting a, a little low on time, so I'm not gonna kind of um, uh, go through all the algebra, but uh, putting, I mean, it, the algebra is totally elementary. Putting this all together, what we get is the following uh, formula. 
Oh, this is Frobenius. It's fine. It says that if we take G divided by C1 cross dot 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 cross Cm times the number of elements in the set that we're interested in, C1 to Cm in C1 cross dot 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 Cm, such that the product of the Ci's in order is equal to 1. If we and, and let me just point out about this normalization. If you, if you did this, kind of, if you imagine that things were random, you would expect the number of elements in the set to be basically the number of elements in this product divided by the number of elements in the group, since after all, um, the product of CI could be any group element. If you think that they're all equally likely, then the number of elements in the set should exactly cancel out this expression, and this whole left-hand side should be equal to 1. And now let me tell you what the right-hand side is. The right-hand side is the sum over all irreducible characters of chi of C1, dot, 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 chi of Cn, divided by chi of 1 to the power of n minus 2. It was n minus 1 before, but we get an extra factor of chi, chi 1 over here, and so it's chi of 1 to the power of n minus 2. Okay, so this is the formula. Now, I said that if you imagine that things are sort of random, um, you would think that the left-hand side would be about one. How big would you expect the right-hand side to be? Well, one irreducible character is uh, chi equals the trivial character, the trivial one-dimensional representation, and that will always contribute one to this expression. And so the interesting question is whether if you take all the other characters together, whether that will um, greatly perturb the answer or whether the answer will come out to be about one. That is to say, do you hit one as a product of conjugacy classes about as often as you would expect? And um, the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no, but you can read this off if you understand enough about the values of characters. Um, the last thing I want to say about this is, um, you, know, you might ask, okay, ultimately why would anyone care? I mean, it's interesting that you can count this thing in two different ways, a kind of set theoretic way and a, and a character theoretic way, but what good is it all? Um, you know, I think when Frobenius uh, did it, it was just something he could do. But it turned out that this, this uh, acquired a new life because of um, the inverse Galois problem. Well, this gives an approach to the inverse Galois problem. So let me remind you what the inverse Galois problem is. Prove that every finite group G is isomorphic to the, Ga the Galois group of K over Q for some field K. All finite groups arise as Galois groups over Q. And the reason is, is the following sort of remarkable theorem, which I think I've been due to Thompson, but I, I don't know that that attribution is exactly accurate. So I'll just Thompson question mark, um, uh, given a strictly rigid, I'll tell you what that is, n-tuple of rational conjugacy classes in G, uh, we can construct So if, if there exists a, a strictly rigid n-tuple of contingency classes, then the answer to the inverse Galois problem is yes, there is such a, there is such a, okay. Um, but what, what is this business about strictly rigid? So strictly rigid means, means that the conjugation action of G on the set of things that we're counting, uh, such that product CI conjugation action of G is simply transitive. And um, uh, rational class 
character values are rational. That's another story. It usually happens. The, the, the simple transitivity is, is a sort of unusual situation. It means in particular that the number of solutions is exactly equal to three. It's, it's definitely an unusual situation, but it's not that unusual. So that, for example, the largest of the finite simple groups, the monster group, which is order about 10 to 22, uh, does have uh, a rigid ripple. And so we do know that, that it arises as a Galois group with an extension of Q. It's kind of amazing. It, um, it's, it's amazing that the, that the character table, uh, I mean, I, I, at least I find it amazing that the character table of the monster group enables us to prove something like this. Okay, I'll stop here and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Michael. Are, are there are there any questions? Uh, a couple minutes before we switch meetings. Any questions? I'll ask a question then. Uh, in the in the wild bestiary of finite groups, uh, which group uh, are you the most tantalizing unsolved case of the inverse Galois problem? So uh, that's an interesting question. And I think um, from my point of view, if you know a group by name, <laughs> you have a very good chance of, of being able to nail it somehow. I mean, that's an exaggeration. But, um, you know, I, I, for me, it's not so much trying to get all the simple, finite simple groups, although there are some that are Maybe if I were a really hardcore member of this community, I would say, oh yeah, the, the Thompson group is a killer, uh, maybe. But um, I tend to think it's more that, you know, uh, the extension problem, you know, even if you know that several groups satisfy the inverse color problem, how would you, seems like to me that that would be probably the harder, the harder part, but, but really, I don't know. I don't really have the right to an opinion on this problem. Uh, I, I'm just a, an amused spectator. Uh, well, what's been, been done. I would not have guessed that the monster group would go before people finished SLN of FP for all primes P. Like, that would not have seemed like a natural thing to happen. If I remember correctly, it's still unknown for the matcher group M23. Is that true? Okay, I mean, I, I, I believe you. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you probably are the person who should be asked this question, not me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on it, though, uh, but uh, I, I was told uh, well, quite a few years ago now, so that might have changed. Uh, I think that was the only sporadic group for which the question was still open, but okay. it's open for quite a number of groups of Lee type. Right. Right, in fact, uh, Shekhar Kare uh, and I, um, you know, idea that one could try to use automorphic forms methods to try to do it for groups of Lie type, but, but our, our methods really, um, I mean, it was sort of more proof of principle than, than actually, I mean, you know, there are some things that will be doable in this way, but it's certainly not something you could do systematically the way we were doing it. Other, other questions? Okay, uh, last call. Okay, shall I stop sharing the screen? Sure, yeah, if there are no other questions, let's uh, thank Michael again. Whether annual applause or uh, virtual applause. Um, and, uh, and then we're, we're going to transition meetings. It'll be a different Zoom call for the actual colloquium. So I'm, and that, that link was also sent out in the- I have that link. So, so I will disconnect and, and reconnect to that link now.